Growing up, I used to wonder how it would feel to be tall, taller than I actually was, or to be normal. Um, I always wondered how it feels to be someone who's normal, who just leaves their house easily, without the stares, the fingers pointing at you, or even the laughter. Must be nice, right? I have a medical condition known as achondroplasia. It is characterized by short limbs, be it the legs or the arms. It also comes with a whole lot of challenges from uh, mobility to bone strength and a whole lot of other things that I won't go into right now. Um, I, I grew up in the Eastern Cape. With this condition, I lived in a community that was very supportive, but I think most importantly, my family and my parents who really understood the challenges I would have to face in my upbringing. And I think they did a lot of preparation for me. One of the key things they focused on was to make me understand that education was very important for me. Because number one, education was going to help give me choices in life. It was also going to be able to enable me to have autonomy, live the way I want to live um, and however I wanted to live. So this is something that I value even today. Um, just going back to achondroplasia, um, from a statistical point of view, we have almost a million uh, people in the world with the condition. It happens every one in 20,000. That's the prevalence of newborns. And average height parents can have this condition, can have children with this condition, as is the case with my parents. So when I look back at my upbringing, I think the principal thing, again, was education, love. I grew up in a family that was full of love. My family affirmed me. They made me understand and accept the fact that I was worthy. Um, I qualified and that I was wanted. And most importantly, I was loved. Um, and I think it did a lot to enable me to be the kind of person I am today. When I look back again in my childhood, I remember there were hardly any role models, people that looked like me, for me to aspire to. When I looked at the media, in the media landscape, whether it was magazines, books, or even films or movies, the only characters you will see um, were people that were typecast maybe as clowns, maybe pixies, you know, mystical, mystical characters, or if not, um, jokers, people that just didn't have a serious character like your normal everyday person. And I would look at this and wonder, but where are people like me that are actually leaders, bosses, heroes, mothers, wives, husbands? There was never any of that. And, and, and I grew up thinking, okay, I need better. I need different for myself. But then again, as I look back, in order for you to understand where I am right now, one of the memories that comes to mind as someone who grew up in a small town was um, an occasion where the, the, there was a circus in, um, in my hometown, which is Mtata in the Eastern Cape, South Africa. And I was very excited. It was going to be my first encounter, you know, first time for me to go and see a circus. Very exciting. We got our tickets. There we were inside the arena. We got our drinks. We've got our popcorn, candy floss, all of those nice things. And we have our seats. The show starts. Beautiful. The show was beautiful. All the acrobatics. All this very fancy and, and very interesting movements and things, you know, um, feats that the, the, the cast was doing. Amazing, amazing. Then came the moment when the character of the clown steps in. What I remember, I remember this discomfort I felt as I sat there watching that segment of the show. And what I remember about it, what, it struck, what, what struck me about that performance was the fact that it was a different performance. It was not about sheer genius. It was not really about showing extreme um, physical prowess of, you know, of this character. The, the character was used as some you know, inhuman object that was being thrown up and down, bounced like a ball, though it's a human. And, and, I, I, and, and, and he would sometimes just do his tricks and look at the 
audience in a very caricatured way, you know, prompting audience and people laughing. And I was just unsettled about this in terms of this representation of this person that I couldn't even see because this is, was a person that was behind a costume and behind the mask and the makeup of a clown. And again, I thought, okay, is this all that they could have given this character of a clown? But then we moved, um, as we found our way outside of the arena, we are walking out to find our car, I realized that I was becoming a bit uncomfortable. I was feeling unsettled, and it was a feeling that I realized I didn't have before the show. And what it was, really, I realized that there were a lot of eyes on me or directed at me, again, those fingers pointing at me, and then again, maybe some laughing, and even some of them using the same name of the character of the clown directed at me. And then I realized, oh, hang on, or oh, it seems I have unwillingly, you know, assumed the character of the clown. So I was the amusement, I was the clown. And then it, it's just a memory that stayed with me, and then I was very clear from then that Actually, I could never be this because I don't like it. I don't like what it represents. I think I'm a serious individual and I want to be seen as someone who's serious, who's intelligent, who contributes in a different way. And honestly, I do not want to take anything away from the livelihood of the character that was behind the clown because I believe that any work is honorable. But we have a choice in terms of who we want to become and the kind of work we want to do. So moving on in life, I mean, I have this, this feeling at the back of my mind, and I'm very clear that whatever I do, I want meaning, I want purpose, I want dignity, I want respect in terms of the field I'm going to ultimately follow. So I ended up, I did go to university, I ended up... Um, finding myself in the financial services industry um, as a marketing and communications consultant um, or professional. Um, the role had, um, and the industry, and the job itself, as I start, when I think about it, there were quite a lot of challenges. Obviously, you have your moments where you feel um, you are treated slightly different or maybe there is mistrust in terms of your capacity or your capability. Is she smart enough? Can she handle it all? Can we trust her with these responsibilities? Can we trust her with this you know, project? There was all of that, but I think at the back of my mind, I was very clear. One of the things I knew is that I was smart and I worked on myself. I would work on myself every time before I go to work. I pre I preempt all the meetings I would go to, kind of rehearse, and so that I'm confident as I step out, I know exactly what to say, what to do. Um, so I, I wanted my skills or expertise and my knowledge not to be questionable. And with all those challenges, as I say, that there were moments where I feel that I could have been overlooked as it happens in life. And sometimes I would question, is it because? But I would work hard in terms of not staying there because again, when you also reinforce the negativity that the world imposes on you, it does not help. I always wanted to stay in the positive, to know that I'm worthy, I am capable, I am as smart as everyone else. In fact, if you have me in your team, you are blessed. Um, so, so, so I, I, I moved in my career with, with that notion. And I must say, I've also had the fortune and the privilege of working with some very um, forward-thinking leaders who had the foresight and who had the courage to trust me with responsibilities, who trust me with high-profile work that would give me more visibilities um, within the organization I was working at. So that helped me a, a lot of, a, a lot. Um, but I do know that even today, um, sometimes when I step into a boardroom, I know, especially with people who don't know me, it's always very interesting the reaction I get. It ranges from, you know, a surprised or it's a shock or people are uncomfortable. People are anxious, like, oh, wow, what is this now? Oh, can she do it? Who is she? And wow, okay. But sometimes people are just open um, and, and recipient to 
having someone that is different, having um, time um, for me to, to express what it is that I can do. But at the back of my mind, when I step into a boardroom, I have this notion that, you know, the reception can go either way. And then it, 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 it makes me understand again that, you know, Sometimes it is that clown character behind me, next to me, that is just always there. Because sometimes people do not see me, Tobega. They see this um, this front that they see that get, make, help makes them think in a particular way. And I have that um, I have that um, in mind. So I. Unfortunately, when you are characterized as the other or someone who's different, you always have to put your foot first and you always have to go into certain spaces having that understanding in mind. And you always quick to make sure that I deserve to be here just like anybody else. I am capable, I am worthy, and I can do what needs to be done. Um, so it, it, it's really, it really is a challenge. But I say this, and I use the example of the clown because I know that it's not, it does not only apply to me, but wherever, if you feel you are different, you feel you have that clown character hanging above you. It could be the fact that you are queer. It could be the fact that maybe your body shape, body size, skin tone, hair texture, your culture, your values, whatever it is, that is different. That makes people don't see who you are, but they have discomfort, they have fears with working with you, trusting you, because you are just different. And I think right now the environment is very rife uh, for us to have a conversation and be able to speak out for ourselves. Um, more often than not now, the conversation around inclusion, diversity, equity, participation is on the table. And I often say that it's not just a trendy topic. It's a basic fundamental human right. We all have a right to participate. We all have a right to be here. So, and I think if you feel like you're being misaligned, whatever, now is the time because this um, discussion is on the table everywhere from economics to politics, in society, in the field of arts, in the field of design. Everyone is talking about inclusion, equity, access for all. So do not feel embarrassed. It is, it is time for you to speak out and it's time for you to, to take your space. And then I want, as I close, I really want to say or, or share in terms of my views, in terms of my experience, what I feel each and every one of us can do in terms of extending ourselves and being allies for people that are different to us and making sure that there's room for everyone. There's a space for government, there's space for policy and legislation, that is fine. And you find that legislation and policy is all taken care of, we all know our rights, they are well tabulated, but the reality is when it comes to normal day-to-day -day lived experiences, it's different. And the thing that makes a difference is you and I. So there are three things that I'd like to leave you with, is first of all, all of us, we always have to constantly examine our biases whether we are conscious of them or unconscious of them, whether they are visible or invisible, we all have things that we are uncomfortable about. Maybe I'm uncomfortable amongst Muslim people. No, I'm uncomfortable against, uh, uh, amongst gay people. I'm uncomfortable against this type of person or this type of socialization. Find out, ask yourself why, and if you can, have a conversation with grace and kindness with people in that group so you understand. And you'll find that your fears or discomfort is really unfounded. It's just because you don't, you don't know. And you've never been exposed to this difference. And as you converse, as you explore, and as you learn, you'll find that we are all just the same. So knowledge, understanding is very, very important. And when you do ask these questions, make sure that you see, make sure that you hear, and make sure that you understand. And then the second one is open yourself to different experiences, especially if you are in a leadership position or a leader in society, a leader in the workplace. How can you lead people whose experiences in their normal lives at home you don't understand? How can you run a business that provides services in communities you've never been to? You know, explore so that you understand and you'll find that even your understanding will help you provide better services, better products, and even be a better boss to your staff because you understand where everyone comes from. 
And then the third one, which I believe is very, very important and something I live by is to say, you know, consider the people that are not part of the discussion. Consider whoever is not in Rome because you are a chosen group that has to decide on whatever needs to be done for a larger group of people that are not in this room. What are people's concerns? What is it that, you know, that keeps them awake at night? And if you make these decisions, think hard in terms of how will it affect them. I mean, when I look at corporate, for example, there's so many things that are biased against a lot of people. Just the technology, the algorithms, the processes, the systems. There's a chosen few that decide on the systems and the processes of an organization or for customers. But no one really thinks far and hard enough, does this work for the majority? And is this going to take us where we go? So there's, there's things like that. Biases is in tech. It is in the things we do. It's in the language we speak. We leave others out because of the language, because of the culture. Even some of the values and the, and the vision of an organization can be very exclusionary while we think it's supposed to be all-encompassing. So these are the things that I feel as individuals, whether we're leaders in our communities, whether we're just ordinary people, we need to consider so that there is room and we make space, we make things comfortable for everyone as, as much as we can. But I like to say, even though everyday people have got a responsibility to make sure that everyone is participating in society, the biggest responsibility is on leaders. Because you hold, you, you are the creators of decisions. You are the creators of these policies, laws and rules. And if it starts with you to make sure that everyone is let in, we'll, 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 we'll get to a better, a better space. I also want to just say that for those who may feel, again, that they are the other, those who are abnormal, those who are not maybe part of the mainstream, again, there's no better time like now. We are having this conversation now. And speak out, raise your hand, raise your voice, because we all belong. We all have, um, we all have a space. We all need to participate. This is all our world, and the world is big enough for all of us. We are beautiful in our hues, in our textures, in our different shades. I like to say that, and I want to leave you with this, that Consider or think about it if you hadn't experienced me or you hadn't come and experienced me. I like to think just you in come experiencing me as brief as it may have been. I hope I have been a beautiful experience. I hope I have been an enlightening experience. I think I've made you understand that indeed we are all beautiful and we all deserve to be heard and we all have a right to be here. And if you have learned something and you feel you are someone like me, maybe who has that clown character around you, behind you, always with you, it is time to cut the cord, and it's time for you to break free and present yourself in your true, authentic self. And you'll find that as you do that, you free others, because as we move, others are watching and they are learning from us. I hope this has been a beautiful experience for you. Thank you. Thank you.